Um, uh, my name is Stuart Waiton. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of you already know me, but in case you don't, uh, I'm an academic and for the purposes of this evening, I'm the chairperson of the Scottish Union for Education, which is a union set up for uh, parents, grandparents and communities, as you can see from the strap line <clears throat> behind me, to ch challenge indoctrination in schools, which takes a variety of forms, uh, some more weird and wonderful than others, um, and some extremely depressing and dangerous. And one of the main concerns that we have, and one of the massive concerns that we found that parents have, is about trans ideology in schools, not just high schools, primary schools, and also recently I found out in nursery schools, um, it gets ever younger. Um, and so we're delighted, uh, absolutely delighted to have uh, Graeme Linehan with us today. I'll say a little bit more about us at the end, but just to point out at this stage that we do have a pamphlet that was written uh, very recently by Dr. Jenny Cunningham for us, called Transgender Ideology in Scottish Schools. What's wrong with government guidance? I can give you a short answer to that, everything. Um, and that pamphlet you can find on our Substack. There's an e-copy and she can go to our uh, Substack that she can find online uh, and feel free to send that to your, uh, your head teacher, teachers, counselors, MSPs um, and so on. As I say, absolutely delighted. I know everyone always says absolutely delighted. I am absolutely delighted uh, to have Graham Linehan with us today. Um, partly because of his comedy. He is a legend. And you know, I was just looking over his uh, biography. Of the last 20 years of work, uh, whatever he is, he's not a lazy man. And he's produced comedy that I suspect everybody uh, no, certainly everyone uh, in Ireland and the UK, and I suspect uh, far beyond that. He's won uh, 100 BAFTAs or so. <laughs> um, he's, uh, and for me, I suppose, uh, my introduction to Graham is uh, at least initially through Father Ted. And for the purposes of this event, I was trying to work out if I could put a tiny little mark on the camera here, so that I ended up with a little uh, Hitler moustache, um, and I would then be shouting at the screen, trying to insist that uh, I am not a racist, or perhaps more particularly, I would be saying Stuart Waiton, not a bigot, uh, yeah. as that's what my uh, my trans friends uh, like to call me, and of course. That brings us also back to Graham, who ironically and tragically has found himself in a situation where he has been cancelled as also being a bigot, apparently, um, around the question of transgender ideology that haunts society at the minute. Uh, and in this respect, as much as anyone connected with the UK, I think Graham has been astronomically brave in what he has done. And I was... Uh, chatting to my wife early and trying to think of anyone who has been who's in the public eye who has taken a stand on this more than Graham and I genuinely uh, couldn't think of anyone I'm going to do a, a sh as short an interview as possible for th about 30 minutes really just so because I, I want all of you guys to have a chance to uh, uh, talk to Graham uh, yourselves and do feel free to ask him as much about his work as his campaigning or anything you want. So we, we could end up with a very strange kind of conversation where one minute we're laughing hilariously and the next minute we're weeping uncontrollably or possibly doing the same, uh, the two things at the same time. But we'll see, we'll see how that pans out. So thank you, Graeme. Thanks for coming. And I'm just going to kick off. This is a question I always ask people that have come on as we're about education. Um, yeah. What were you like as a kid and what was your school life like? Ah, well, it's a bit of a cliche for, for someone who's in comedy, but I was uh, bullied. I was bullied quite a lot. Um, and uh, it made it all the more ridiculous that I was extremely tall and could probably have, you know, flattened most of the people who were giving me trouble. 
but uh, I was never hugely aware of my own height. And my mom had always uh, reacted to violence with terror, I would say. And she kind of instilled in me then a fear of, you know, hurting someone or, you know, uh, taking revenge and stuff. So um, so I was kind of uh, defenseless a little bit in school um, and uh, bullied to to such an extent that, you know, I, I, I didn't find any value in school at all. I, I um, you know, I, I remember Irish classes because uh, we all have to, have to learn Gaelic. And, um, you know, the, me and the teacher had a kind of unspoken agreement that she wouldn't ask me any questions in Irish. And I, I wouldn't make it too obvious that I was reading Stephen King novels uh, all through her class. So it was just a kind of a, um, uh, uh, usually a thing that I just had to withstand. I also had an extremely sadistic teacher who I think targeted me from when I was very young and he saw me making fun of him. And, uh, you know, I, I, every year after that, I was like, I was like, why does this guy have such a problem with me? And and it was when I was like 18 that I realized, oh yeah, it was because I made fun of him when I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, it was kind of, uh, it wasn't a happy time for me. It wasn't a time where anyone really took me seriously or or listened to me. The only thing that that, that had, a, had a, a kind of effect on my fortunes was doing school debates which I treated more like comedy stand-up acts. Um, everyone, you know, we were supposed to make a, a, a an argument for whatever the subject was, but I would just I would just write lots of jokes, and uh, some of them were kind of I guess vaguely rude. So I got I started getting a better reputation among the kind of people who were who were usually uh, you know uh, chasing me around the schoolyard. So I had a brief period towards the end of my shall we say career in school. As a child, as a school child, um, uh, where things went well, but up until then, it was it was pretty miserable, you know. I did like English, um, and uh, sometimes history could be good, but generally, it was it was just something I withstood. I'm really sorry to say that, probably to a, a room. Full of <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely fine. I mean, but, but this was like the proper old days, you know. Like I was born in 1968, so you know this was like it wasn't quite Kez. <laughs> it was the generation or two after Kez, uh, but you know when we watched Kez, even if you know it was a fairly, it was a much nicer school than the one in Kez, but you still felt that little tingle of of um, of uh, empathy when the kid gets hit in the hand with a with a cane I don't know if you remember the scene but he's he's just queuing to give a message to the teacher and uh, he's brought in with this gang of wrongans and he's just kind of um given a a, a whip of the uh cane and uh that kind of unfairness and and uh misery uh is is kind of I'm afraid what I associate with school you know yeah I mean, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because I, I'm quite keen on the idea that schools need to have discipline. But of course, part of the memory of the past is that part of that was not was not great for Yeah, it was just administered in a in a weird way. You know, there's there's other things you can do to kids to punish them, you know. They don't like losing an hour of playtime. So, you know what I mean? But I guess, you know, it's like how do you how do you deal instant justice? I like the point system from from Hogwarts. I think that's a good idea, you know. Although there's a there's a touch of um, if you lose points for your house, there's a touch of uh, uh, you know um, uh, the way prison guards try and turn people against each other. <laughs> You're going to get battered by the other kids. Yes, exactly, exactly. So there's 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 good and bad things to be said for every system. I'd say, you know. But well, I mean, so so you said. I mean, I'm assuming you must have got something out of school unless you were reading an awful lot because I can't imagine you can end up being this successful an individual and comedy writer unless you are educated. Sure, but again, it was kind of done despite the school rather than 
because of the school. You know, I I learned how to uh, write from Stephen King, you know, at, at my age, when I was 16, 14. I can't remember exactly when I first discovered him, but reading him was so viscerally thrilling that I just fell in love with reading, you know. And uh, definitely my English classes, which were definitely my favorite of everything, my English classes probably added um, a bit of, uh, what would you say, context and, and kind of heft to the things I was reading and, and gave me uh, uh, the language to uh, talk about it and enjoy it, you know? And I became a, a, a critic when I left school um, and, and that probably helped a lot. But really, I guess I, I'm kind of self self taught, <laughs> you know. My 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 the the way I got into comedy, you know, I I couldn't really have done it through a, n a normal means, you know. I it, comedy is a weird world, and I think the thing that I learned to do in school through my own reading and through my own kind of um, educating myself. Uh, was follow my passions wherever they led. And they often led into places that were, you know, extremely interesting and surprising to me, you know. Um, so uh, so just describe that to me, right? Because how, for, for any normal person, right? I'm going to say everyone else here is normal apart from you. But for, for any normal person, the idea of writing... Not for me, no, we're all normal people. <laughs> <laughs> any any novels, any novels. Writing comedy for television is kind of like how does that happen? So how does it? How did it happen? Well, it's a very different different world now. You know, I mean, I think now, but actually, I do think it's an important thing to 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 to, to teach people about. Like, if I if 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 people here were interested in comedy writing, this would be the lesson I'd give, which is. Um, you know, the way we in the old days, of course, there were a very limited number of uh, of platforms. Um, and the one we found uh, one day I was looking at uh, TV and I saw the list of credits on a uh, certain show, uh, a sketch show. And there were loads of writers. And I thought, oh, my God, they probably take submissions. So I, um, I you know, Arthur and I had literally like I was over already doing music journalism, uh, getting a kind of a reputation as a funny writer. Uh, and Arthur, I asked him to come over to to see if we could make a living at it. Uh, in the spirit of what one man can do, another can do, uh, which I believe is a Shackleton quote. Um, uh, but like, um, it was that kind of spirit. It was like, well, why not? And also, and I don't want to sound like a snob, but there were certain TV programs that were on television at the time. And we were like, how, how did this even get made? We, we used to be like, we used to, our question was, where did, where did they laugh when they wrote this scene? Where did they laugh? And we would think this again and again and again. And Arthur and I, you know, we weren't dummies. Arthur was a smart guy. And I figured I was smart because Arthur could bear me. Um, uh, we knew we could just beat it. So, um, so yeah, so that kind of leads on to the problem that I think modern writers have, which I think is a real thing they should think about, which is um, uh, if you don't, if you don't put, post everything you do on screen, if you don't post everything you do publicly, um, if you only post the good stuff the really good stuff in fact if you only post what you consider almost perfect because nothing is ever perfect then and you and you you let's say you film 10 things and you put up one of them that's better than filming 10 things and putting up all of them you know there was a thing that went viral recently very funny very funny video many many of you might have seen it it was a tiktok video and it was a guy uh, just doing an impression of every TikTok live, which is when people just turn on the camera and, and talk and, and come up with nonsense. It's absolutely hilarious. Very, very funny. Uh, and so I followed his account and you look through his account and, you know, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but your, your impression of the guy comes down to a kind of a mean average, you know, 
I mean mean as in mean. You know, like you, you, you kind of suddenly don't love the guy as much as you used to. So that's that's the danger that these that people are in th these days, which is they they'll be tempted to put up absolutely everything that they do, and you you should you should just only put put the good stuff up because then everybody thinks you're oh my god everything this person does is amazing, and they don't know that you've done just as much bad stuff as every other creator. You know, because it's it's on your uh, it's on your editing room floor. You know. So well, and and this is a crap question, but I'm going to ask it. But feel free to say that's a crap question, then we can move on. Uh, so you just put the best stuff. What's your best stuff? What 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 are you most proud of? In, oh, in terms of in terms of your comedy writing. Oh, I'm proud of everything. You know, I don't. I can't watch it. So I don't really have an objective view on what it, how it, much it stands up now. Um, you know, uh, I, I find it, I, you know, once you've written or made something, you've watched it like a thousand times in, in little permutations. And sometimes you have to make decisions about a joke that could go one way and instead you make it go another way. And and maybe you're haunted that the other way, maybe that was the right way to go. So everything, it's you, if you wait a few years, though, you kind of forget all that stuff and you can watch things and enjoy them. But I haven't dared, dared <laughs> yet. You know, I watched something the other day, something I was proud of. Uh, and I and I just was like, I was just embarrassed all the way through it. You know, I was showing it to someone thinking it was a great ep episode. And, and I was like, oh, this is nowhere near as good as I thought it was. So, you know, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. I I, I think the thing I uh, will say, though, is that Count Arthur Strong uh, is, I think, as good as anything I've done, but no one's seen it, you know. Um, oh. I'm sure some people here have, but 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 in terms of BBC numbers, what they expect for a show, no one saw it. So they so they dropped it. Yeah. In fact, a funny thing happened to me. I was um, I heard that Netflix had bought it and I was like, wow, how much money do I get for that? So I rang up my agent and I said, uh, listen, uh, how much what do I get? Uh, I heard it's on Netflix. What do I get for that? And she said, uh, oh, I'll get back to you. And she hung up and rang me back a few minutes later and said, uh, no, you owe them money. And I was like, how does that work? And she says, well, the BBC only showed it once, but when you get paid, you automatically get paid for a repeat, the first repeat. And because they never got, they never repeated it, they're making back their money from Netflix before you get anything. So, uh, so I still haven't really seen any money from Count Arthur being on Netflix. Wow. So, um, I still wish people would watch it. I might end up getting paid for it someday, but but it's a really good show. Okay, good recommendation, everyone. Yes, all all, all go and watch that, but not not quite yet. Right on to the less comedic side of your life, or well, I don't know. I suppose that's kind of debatable, depending on how yeah. you how you look at it. But yeah. how did you get into the trans thing? I I keep I, you know what I have I have asked myself this many many times. A lot of people think it's. Uh, it's because I wrote an episode of the IT crowd that had a trans character and I got into trouble for it because I didn't yet realize at that point that you're not allowed to say anything at all, anything at all about uh, the trans issue or trans people. Um, I thought, oh, they're just like us. They're just going to have a sense of humor and they're going to love this. <laughs> no. Um, but, uh, but like, I don't think it was then. I think where it actually came from was a online uh thing that happened a few years before it or, or or just dovetailed with it called Gamergate and Gamergate was a weird thing that I used to think I understood and when people would ask me about it when I was a good little lefty I would I would give the stock response which is um it Gamergate is just a misogynistic hate campaign that's all it is and people would be like, oh, I'm a bit confused, and, you know, and I would always think that this was just them being bamboozled by right wingers, you know. Uh, no, no, no. It's just a misogynistic hate campaign. And um, and what it was, it's too hard and confusing to go into. But but a very, very condensed version is that uh, 
there was a, some some controversy over a woman. She was accused of sleeping with people for good reviews. It wasn't true. So her friends defended her and attacked, uh, you know, a wider portion of, of gamers than, than were involved in the original scandal. So gamers got, got um, uh, you know, insulted and started to bed in. And then it also became kind of the first anti-woke campaign. Uh, but at the time, I didn't realize this. I thought it was basically just a misogynistic hate campaign. I thought it was aiming, aimed at getting women offline, you know, uh, and it was to some extent, but also involved where the kind of first uh, signs of some of the worst trolls in uh, the gender fight, you know, uh, you, you've all probably, you're all probably familiar with anime accounts uh, with kill turfs and stuff like this uh, uh, on their um, pages. Uh, but but that that I recognize those anime accounts from Gamergate, mm -hmm. you know, and and it was the same thing then it was it was men pretending to be women. But it was such a kind of a uh, a low investment pretending to be women. I mean, they would literally just have avatars of women and they would call themselves Susie. And I was, and sometimes, and these would, I noticed even during Gamergate, they were particularly vicious to real women, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that what happened was that there was a contingent of opportunistic misogynists online, uh, also kind of, you know, this kind of thing as everything is amplified by, by the internet. I think their numbers were amplified by the internet. And I think when Gamergate started to go to south and it didn't really work for them uh, in their harassment campaigns, um, I think they just switched horses midstream and pretended they were always on the same on, on that side. And just because I think they realized, oh, hang on a sec. We can say we're left wing. We can say we're women. We can shame, humiliate and uh, 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 harass women. Uh, using techniques that, you know, they had seen been used, being used successfully by a lot of left wing uh, voices, you know, the shaming, the the calling out, uh, the trial by by uh, by by Twitter. Um, and they just kind of they just kind of uh, decided to hop on the back of this new movement, which allowed them to be as misogynistic as possible. So, so I think. So, so what did you do? When did you like you crazy crazy fool? When when did you say something, and what did you say? Uh well, you know, there's. I actually found it the other day. It's written down here somewhere. Let me see if I can quickly find it while we're while we're talking because it is interesting in terms of. Um, you know, that's what I keep trying to put across to, to get across to people. Um, you're you, if you whatever you do, the you know, you can be as as sweetly spoken and polite about this issue as uh, you want. But whatever you do, you'll be punished just as much as I was punished. You know, like I always I always think of Rachel Rooney, who wrote this beautiful book called My Body Is Me and had her career completely devastated and is now working as a as a as a, you know as a care assistant and says she will never go back to uh working for uh, working in publishing you know an absolute travesty her book is beautiful my body is me is one of the most beautiful children's books ever written i think it's up there with you know people which which uh, the illustrator's uh, uh mother illustrated um and uh, uh, yeah, so so I can't find it, but my original thing was basically, um, it said something like, uh, here's, here's, here's what I think about the trans issue. And it was like a list of five things and then five things. And it was the very early days in this fight when we all did the same thing. We all used fra the phrases they'd given us as if they had meaning when they actually didn't. So for instance, the, the list would say, you know, I, I believe that trans people need respect. Trans people must be blah, blah, blah. However, and then another list of, you know, women need sports, women need single sex spaces and, and so on. Now, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it like that anymore, because, first of all, I don't know what the word trans people means. Yeah. It's never been explained. 
it covers so many different categories that it's not a useful uh it's not a useful word um so i wouldn't say any of that but at the time you know this was the way you entered into the fight by being polite and respectful and saying and saying hang on a sec there's a very rational thing going on here because these were still the days when we thought that would have an effect when we thought that rationality and politeness would have an effect but it didn't um there's a very funny illustration you may have seen it again. I wish I could. Uh, can I share a screen on this? Is, is that possible? Um, I may not be able to find it anyway. But there's a very funny there's a very funny meme about the trans issue, and it's uh, it's a repurposed cover of a horror novel. And on the right, there's a a roller coaster of women, and they're just setting out on the roller coaster and the, and on the left coming back down the roller coaster are all these crazed harridans with their hair flying and skeletal faces and they're going Aah! and the women going up are going Aah! you know and uh, there's an arrow pointing to both groups <laughs> and the one pointing to the fresh-faced women says something like you know newly arrived polite turfs uh, <laughs> and, then, and then the ones on the left is like you know battle hardened <laughs> and that was that was the trajectory we all went we all started off thinking we'll be polite and everyone will 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 chill out and we can have a conversation about this but you know that turned out to be uh, just completely untrue like 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 one of the early things like James Dreyfus my friend who who was in my first sitcom and is um was then in gimme 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 and and things like this uh, the thin blue line he hasn't worked in 5 years because since he wrote a letter along with me um calling for a more civilized debate you know and when <laughs> when people could, I know it's crazy, isn't it? It's but when, a fascist. Yeah, it's it's just extraordinary. And he hasn't worked since. And 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 like I mean, he's done little things, but not much, not as much as he should be doing because he's a very very talented comic actor, and he does have a level of fame over here, you know, um, uh, for these sitcoms that he did. But um, but for signing that letter, he has been. He gets the same kind of abuse, the same kind of people writing private letters. So you shouldn't hire this person. They're problematic, all that sort of stuff. He gets exactly the same. So when people call me rude and angry and, and whatever else they call me, it's it's because I'm the person coming down on the roller coaster. You know, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm with the Harridans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not going to push this because I think I'll let some of the uh the audience pursue this but i do think it would be worth trying to pursue in the discussion what exactly what you're saying i mean i'm similarly i was i was trying to almost have a conversation with myself a few weeks ago because i spoke to a, a grandfather who has a grandchild who is transitioning and he says from the age of two this boy knew that he was a girl he is a girl Etc. Et and you're in a very difficult position because you're talking to a grandfather and a grandchild, and you're saying they, they haven't been socially transitioned, that'd be this, haven't been that, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so at a conviction that this boy is a girl, and it's kind of you, you look and thinking, where, where, where do you go with this? Because my starting position had said, Well, the thing is, there's no such thing as a transgender child, and even the very idea of transgender doesn't really make sense. And this was his response as well. Obviously, there is because I have a grandchild, right? And that's so that's the end of it. There, there's an objective fact, okay. and it's kind of like you think, well, so where 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 do you go with that, and how how can you think about it? So, I, so I do think that is worth pursuing because I think it's it's quite difficult uh, for a lot of people. I think it's quite difficult for a lot of, of parents, uh, in particular, when they come across this discussion if they haven't really chewed on it and read around it and so on our our instinct to be polite and nice um can kind of get in the way i think sometimes of having to say some hard truths uh about this issue but i'll not i'll not push that at this point because i think i'll let um... no I, I i think it's a fascinating uh uh aspect and i think one of the reasons why i've been um 
uh, as bullshy about this subject as I as I have been is because you know I I I was always a bit of a loner you know and I and I don't have a a, a kind of a structure over me uh, in terms of a job and stuff like this and and when I was in my marriage I I fell into a, a habit uh, I'm not proud of it it's just the way it was um, that I'm sure a lot of um, men fall into which is relying on on one's wife for the social things you know but for me I just like being on my own I was a bit of a a bit of a you know, pain in the arse. Um, uh, social engagements didn't really thrill me. So I was able to just kind of cut myself off from a lot of that. And so when it came time to get into this fight, um, I kind of uh, was able to go, you know, no, that's, this is not based on reality at all, mm-hmm. you know. And your 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 the grandfather, I I do feel terribly sorry for someone of that generation especially because it's so such a convincing story you know it's it's and but unfortunately it's really convincing to people who may have a little bit of homophobia in them in them you know i think that like if you i i don't know i i wouldn't like to go too much into it but i'd be curious to know if you thought that if you brought up that possibility would that grandfather have welcomed it or would he have been hugely insulted mm, yeah i don't know i don't know that's a good yeah. question um, well sally 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 um uh what's her name susie susie green um of mermaids she, until recently there was a ted talk up on um youtube 16 minutes long where I mean, it really is extraordinary. I always encourage people to watch it because, I mean, for three years I was saying, you know, this is actually out there and you can watch it. And she admits to uh, conditioning her child, who was obviously gender non-conforming, into believing he was a girl. And then at 16 years of age, the exact moment that she could do so, she brought him to Thailand and cut his cock off. Excuse me for using that kind of language, but it makes me so angry. Mm. And this is like warm applause from an audience of a TED Talk audience. There's not a single attempt to say, well, this is what trans means. This is why it's different from being gay. You know, there's nothing like that. The story is good boy played with girls toys. Dad didn't like it, which is which is interesting that she actually admits to this in the talk. Um then there's like this kind of uh, uh, gap and it's then boy is now a girl, you know? And it's like, where, where's the bit in between? Where's the bit from didn't plays in girls toys and dresses up like Snow White? Because that's the kind of thing that I think a lot of boys did who still are intact, you know, and are still probably extremely happy gay men, hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, just, I'm not, not uh, go much longer on this because I want to let people come in and um, ask their own questions and make their own contributions about this. But what? Why did you? Why did you pursue it? I, I mean, I, I know I'm saying this in a, in a quizzical way. I mean, I think everyone should be pursuing it because I think it's outrageous. Oh, I, I know. I yeah. Think it's but I mean, it's very unusual. It's you know. Um, I was gonna. It's a simple answer. Like, like no, no, nobody else is doing it. I mean, hardly anyone else is doing it, and yet you, you, they're banging the drum like a like a mad person, kind of like why, why did you do it? <laughs> Two reasons, right? First of all, uh, I have a daughter, and I cannot protect her. I cannot walk around the streets with her and make sure, or, or for instance, go to college, which she's right at the age where she will be doing that. I can't protect her once she once she leaves my house. So the idea that there's signs, as there famously was at Bristol University, that say, that say to young women, if you see someone in the toilets that doesn't look right, don't say anything, don't make a fuss, don't call attention to them. They're being where they feel most comfortable. All this fucking bollocks, excuse my language, that puts women in danger, you know, then I have to actually fight it on a bigger level because it's affecting society. So I have to fight it in a society-wide fight, you know? 
Um, uh, that was the first reason. Uh, uh, the second reason was, uh, what was the second reason? I had two. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, actually, I, you know, here's here's my thing. Again, I'm like you, Stuart. I just don't know why everyone's not doing it. I genuinely thought I'd be doing it for a few months and people would be going, hang on a second, children are being hurt and they'd be rushing along to help, you know? It's like, what the fuck? And it was, it's been like six years nearly and no one is coming, you know? And including all these, oh yeah, I know what the second thing was. Um, I think uh, a, 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 a lot of stuff I've heard, Billy Bragg said this just the other day, and and Jimmy Mulville of um, Fog Hattrick, uh, he said this to me once uh, as well. And I re and as soon as you hear it, your heart sinks because it's it's just a disaster every time. Um, and the phrase is, "My wife says it's not a problem." And just like I outsourced my social life to my wife, these men are outso outsourcing their uh, ethical viewpoint on women to their wives. And they're literally not thinking about it beyond that. And all of these women, Billy Bragg's wife, Jimmy Mulville's wife, these are very well off women who will never have to need a, a shelter or a, or a rape crisis center, you know, God willing. Um, they'll never have to have to put themselves in situations where those uh, spaces, single sex spaces are important. So they don't see the problem. Of course, they don't see the problem. Billy Bragg sold his house for 2.5 million. Of course, he doesn't see the problem, you know. So um, so there's a kind of. A, uh, so, yeah, so that's that's these guys. They they. But I always was interested in women's issues ever since I read um, the, the Cider House Rules, uh, John Irving's book about abortion. Um, and I read that when I was very young and impressionable. And, you know, I was a good Catholic boy. And so abortion for me was like, I just couldn't imagine an argument for it. I couldn't imagine an argument for it. It was like, they're killing babies. You know, that was my level. And reading the Cider House Rules, I realized, you know, which is a beautifully done book. It does exactly what a novel should do. It, it has a very, very, um, uh, it, it, it has a character, there's a character who embodies both arguments uh, in the book. And it comes to a beautiful conclusion, which is, you know, he's actually himself. He's a doctor and he's anti-abortion. And in the end, he has to do them because while it's illegal, he doesn't have the choice because because these women are throwing themselves downstairs and taking poison and this doctor he has to do it you know so it's a beautiful um quandary or or dilemma for a character be, to be placed in had a huge effect on me i realized the world wasn't simple and i realized also i started to realize how you know um li how lowly or i don't know what the word is how low on the in people's regard is for women you know i began to realize how reckless society is with with women and with their lives and and how little is fucking known about about you know women in general you know i remember it wasn't my favorite play. i did i really didn't like it but it was written for me but i saw the vagina monologues once you know and um you know while it wasn't for me it wasn't wasn't up my street uh, uh, it was a hugely empowering and, and um, uh, uh, I, you know, the audience loved it. It was an audience mainly of women. They absolutely loved it because people were talking about vaginas with, 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 without embarrassment and, and, and talking about the various qualities uh, of vaginas and the, and the health risks and all this sort of stuff, you know. And of course, when the gender movement came along, uh, the vagina monologues dropped off the earth. It, it started getting banned from theatres. You know, it's 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 now you'd be lucky to get a performance of it. Um, and that was like how many years ago, 10, 20 years ago, maybe 15, you know, and it's like gone. That was the window that women could talk about their about themselves. That And, and then Elaine Miller uh, up in up in Edinburgh last year. She did a show called Viva uh, Your Vulva because she's she's what she calls a fanny physio. And she she helps women uh, with uh, um 
uh, with the, with that area when uh, things start to go south, I guess you could say. Um, and, uh, you know, because this is a show about women and aimed at women, a, a fellow comedian spat at her in the street. You know, the, like it was called the most loathed show on the fringe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and like you know the her her audiences were treated with rudely and with with withering kind of looks uh, when they went. If you went to one of her shows, you had to actually steal yourself for being treated like you were scum, you know. So I just find it extraordinary that there's such a level of misogyny, so, so much so that that I, I mean I don't know whether you saw today. <laughs> there's these men and women's toilets. I think they're in King's Cross. And Jenny Watson, who's this young lesbian, she uh, took photographs of them. And the man symbol is, as it always always is, little round hole for the head and the, you know, the body with the trousers on, you know. And the woman symbol is now just a circle. It's just a hole. <laughs> a zero, a big fat zero. And it's basically saying there's men who exist and are real. And then there's this other thing that we're not actually sure we can draw anymore. So we'll just replace it with a circle. It's it's outrageous. And, and what's so frightening about it is that it's all happened so quickly that it's just suddenly the water we're swimming in. We're suddenly like, like this is our world. And, it, and it's like, how on earth has it got this far? How on earth did it get this far? Yeah. You know? Well, it's it's funny you should say that about the changing rooms because someone sent me a, an image recently from Strathclyde University. And I, I can't do it justice. It's 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 worse than what I'm going to describe, but it's, it is along those lines of if you see someone in the changing room That's who, one. who you don't think should be there, yeah. um, check yourself, you know, blah, blah, et cetera. And there's a whole list of things, and it's a kind of like, condemnation how dare you think that you should have a changing room for yourself i've actually i, I sort of, i've tried to get a journalist onto that to see if it's actually illegal because i'm not even sure that this is actually legal that you can have these gender neutral changing rooms in a scottish university so if anyone anyone out there wants to get stuck into strathclyde university pop in tomorrow and and ask them about this policy because it's it's extraordinary and the lesbian thing you mentioned lesbian <laughs> one of the things i find I shouldn't laugh, but one of the extraordinary things I find is this idea that lesbians should have sex with men, right? So it's like, you know, it's like a guy says he's a woman, and if you as a lesbian aren't prepared to have sex with him, you're a bigot. And it's like, it's, it's, what, what, what? It's, you know what I mean? The levels of incredulity and madness, it's it's kind of just when you thought it couldn't get any more insane. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's all and it's all done through um, through careful language, like for instance, I don't know if you've heard of the spousal veto, but like uh, every so often there's a the, there's an attempt to remove the spousal veto, and the very use of the word spousal veto, uh, basically they want you to think that this poor man who's who's always been a woman and has only realized it when his wife has three babies and he's getting a bit tired of having any responsibility um this poor man he needs to get his wife's permission can you imagine such a thing he has to get his wife's permission to dress up as a hooker and go to school uh sports days you know it's like well, hang on a second you know there is nothing wrong with a woman deciding hang on a sec that's not what i married that's not what i i signed up for and and getting out of it and and using that as a you know the idea that you can actually impoverish women by not allowing them to get a proper um uh uh divorce when something like ha like that happens is insane it's absolutely insane and yet here we are talking about the spousal veto. I mean, I know we're not talking about it, but but it is. It does come up every so often, you know. And and also, there's like, you know, they will use language uh, like they will say, for instance, it's an invasion of privacy to let someone know about their trans status. You know, you can't. You'll out them. You'll out them as a trans person. You know. So 
so they're trying to remove um uh uh i'm not sure what, where it is in the law books I, I i i'll make a fool of myself if i start bluffing but um basically there is a clause in in rape laws which is rape by deception is a thing and they're trying to change it you know they're trying to change it and it's like why would you do that why would you try to change a a, a rape by deception clause and it's all done with the most inclusive wonderful warm language and it's the most some of the most evil stuff i've ever heard Right, I'm going to bring the audience in in a second. So if you start putting your hands up, people, if you have a question or point you want to make. um, So I was going to ask you about whether comedy is dead, but don't answer that. But I also wanted to just let people know that um, Graham's got a book out. Now, I thought it was out, but it's not. But I do think I read somewhere that the pre-bookings have gone through the roof. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, we, we so got that, so that. So that's good. And the, the, the other thing I wanted to say is, see, I'd heard about, let's say, like, Richard, Richard Ayoade has mentioned something. He basically, he praised your book. Now, I was aware that he'd been attacked for daring to say that your book's a, de- a good book. I had a desire to... You know, just show that he was a friend and 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 uh, and and comment in a in a in a in a in a subtle way on what's going on, and he 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 did it. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I've got three questions. I'll take three. I think. Um, well, I'm just going to try and get as many in as possible. So, Suzanne, off you go. Hello. Um, pre-ordered your book. Um, I really appreciate everything you do. Um, and they, what I want to ask you, there is so much, um, there's so much comedy in all this trans stuff. Uh, where I live in Glasgow, there is a um, cafe called the Pink Peacock. I'm sure any Glaswegians who live around my area in Pollock Shields know about it. And it got closed like a few months ago. And they posted this this um, thing on Reddit. It's this, this sort of like, um, a bit about why they were leaving and stuff and it was so funny and just all the comments in Reddit and then all the Google reviews were so hilarious and I was talking to, we're doing a protest more in um, George Square about education or gender ideology and stuff in education and I was right. talking to my friend that I'm uh, organising it with <laughs> he said <laughs> He was saying, oh, God, it's going to be windy tomorrow. I think we might see a few wigs flying from the other side because we've got counter-protesters. But there is there's so much comedy. When are we going to be able to hear some comedy about this? Yeah, don't don't answer that yet. I'm going to bring the others in, and then we can just put it there. Pamela, you have to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, I'm an enormous fan um, of your work. I don't know how many hours we've watched of Graham Lennon comedies and repeats so many times. My question's around, like, Russell Brand has been a phenomenal example of com- comedic reinvention from the sort of vulgar, shagger, tabloid hero to how the hell he becomes a well-being guru. Um, you've then got other characters like Frankie Boyle going from the abusive, misogynistic, total dick, um, just focusing on women's appearance, and now reinvent himself as, as a progressive DNI sort of blue chip bore. Um, I, you know, I realize that that you you get hooked into comedians, um, characters, a grotesque fascination in their sort of warped and twisted personalities. That's what makes them funny. You wallow in that, you know you shouldn't but you're laughing along at their hideousness. Um, And I don't believe that either Russell Brand or Frankie Boyle or all of any of those guys have changed at all. They're just totally unauthentic. Um, And so you don't find them hooking anymore. And will irreverent comedy ever make a comeback? Yes, that was similar. Okay. Yeah, similar. That's that's useful. Uh, Jenny. Hi. Um, Am I audible? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, yeah. Just to say, well, I'm another fan, but particularly of your trans stuff, um, um, having not had a great deal of exposure other than Father Ted 
to the rest of your comedy. Um, but that question about the grandfather who has a son who's who's definitely a, a girl, is a trans child. Mm. Um, I thought it's hanging in the air, so I thought I'd have a crack at, at just saying how I would respond to it. Because I'd be interested, you you deal an awful lot, um, uh, you, you know, in 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 your work, with, obviously with adult um, with adult questions, and and I just wondered what you you thought about the risk to children. I'm I'm sure you you're as concerned as we are. Yeah. I think the thing I would say to the grandfather is actually you're describing a typical case of gender dysphoria. The classical gender dysphoria, which we recognized in the early 90s, right? With a very small group of particularly young boys were convinced, absolutely convinced for various reasons they were girls. And that persisted. It persisted right through their childhood until, hey, presto, they got to puberty and it all seemed to resolve. Yeah. Very, very few actually, um, you know, persisted in that at all. So I would say to the grandfather, I think your child has dysphoria in its classic sense. He may not be unhappy about it. You know, the family might be, but he is not a trans kid. He's a kid with classical gender dysphoria. And the thought that he might be put on a path to transitioning at some stage because his school socially transition him and then hey presto he gets referred to a gender um, mm. you know clinic and it's horrifying to think of that little lad landing up as you say um <laughs> castrated yeah yeah anyway i just wondered what your your, your feeling was about the sort of childhood end of of this horror story. Oh yeah, well, I, first of all, I think that that's a good good solution that you've hit on because you don't need to, you know, go into the minefield of suggesting the child might be gay. So I think that's a very good good uh, way to approach it. It's funny, but you because we were talking about two questions about the future of comedy and and this, it it actually reminds me of. Um, I don't know. Do you? Everyone will probably remember Kevin the teenager on Harry Enfield, and I don't know if you remember, but like for the whole of the whole of the run, Kevin the teenager is non-communicative, depressed, acne-filled. He's got his hair down over his eyes. He answers every question rudely, uh, and he is just a, a mess, a mess of a person. And the final episode in that in that uh, story, he goes to a party and he gets laid. You know, he, he he has sex with a with a young woman who who, for whatever reason, sudden sees something in him, and uh, and he loses his virginity. And the next scene is uh, his friend who's still in the same pre pre you know pre pubertal I guess state. Uh, knocks on the door as he always does every day to meet him and Kevin the teenager opens the door and he's wearing a crisp pink shirt or something or lime green shirt his hair is combed and he is totally transformed he's like hello how are you oh, I'm afraid I can't play today I've got to do something at home anyway bye bye and he closes the door beautiful ending the 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 kid who's still stuck in in his terrible pre you know pre-pubertal state it goes off on his own and it's it's heartbreaking but that is the that's the experience uh, every parent recognizes it you get a number of years of complete you know distress and then one day it's just gone it's just gone it might not be tied to you know, someone having sex, but it, but but it, but it does. It is certainly tied to getting through something, you know, and and that's what I think is 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 so frightening about this in terms of kids. They're they're literally stopping these kids from going through that, and 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 as 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 people on my sides are beginning to say, puberty is a human right. 
you know it should not be interrupted for 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 you know only like i know puberty uh, blocking drugs are given to children who are you know who 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 have early onset puberty because that's a problem if you're you know eight year old who's 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 getting erections and stuff like that so yeah they have um puberty suppressing drugs for that but you know they're not for cosmetic or recreational reasons you don't give them to kids unless you have to give them to kids and so um uh so yeah i agree with you i think the danger to children is terrible and i also find it incredibly insidious and creepy and i don't know why it's not a bigger uh scandal that schools are stopping uh, parents from letting their kids know what sex education materials are being used uh, some of the sex education materials that are being revealed are completely freaky and disgusting. Like, I don't know if you know, but Gender Queer, um, one of the books that's that's uh, that gets into trouble regularly, you know, it's about two young women, one of whom thinks they're a trans man. Uh, and there's one scene where one young girl is going down on the other young girl who's wearing a dildo, who's wearing a strap-on dildo. This is not... This is not, there's no planet on which that's good to teach kids or to show kids. It just puts strange things in their heads that they cannot connect with. And I feel that this girl who drew the um, comic is as much a victim of this as the, the people who read this disgusting comic. You know, I think she has been confused and and frightened of sex and scared and and made to think a bunch of things that aren't true. And unfortunately, she's going to have to work through that um, at her own speed, which kind of brings me on to the comedy question, because for me, um, for me, it's a little it would be a little like doing a an aid sitcom in the 80s. You know, I, I feel like I feel like it's too current. I do feel like, you know, when people go, why are you obsessed? Uh, I am I am obsessed. But I, my question is, why isn't everyone obsessed? This is this is extremely dangerous. It's already hurt some kids irreparably, you know, like like poor. There's one young woman, beautiful young woman, but she's like, you know, she's 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 suffering terribly because of what she did to her body. And there's no way back for her, you know. So, like, I just don't feel, I don't feel it's funny, you know? I mean, sometimes things pop out. Like, the way I put it to people is writing a comedy about this uh, subject would be, is in many ways, a, a bit of a Coles to Newcastle situation. Because there's certain, that, I don't know if you saw, but recently there was a some sort of re religious service devoted to drag queens, you know? And it was like the most, it looked like a, a scene from Star Wars. It was hilarious. So the only way I think you could approach this comically is actually through a documentary, is actually through showing, you know, like I don't think there's much, much any, many things that you can beat uh, than um, uh, Keir Starmer unable to tell people whether women have a cervix. I mean, that's already hilarious, you know? Um, uh, so yeah, so so and and to 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 use that to jump on to the question about um, uh, irreverence that Pamela said, um, the problem with irrelevant irrelevant <laughs> how do you say it? I'm saying irrelevance uh, irreverence. The problem with irreverence at the moment is that you know for something to be for for there for you to be able to see something there has to be light, but for the if it was just all light, you wouldn't be able to see it. And in the same way, the the world at the moment is so uh, turned upside down. It's already so, you might say, irreverent. Uh, one even might say queer, you know, um, because queer theory is behind a lot of what's going on at the moment. In a world like that, there's no irreverence because what is irreverence? If the world is so already so insane, then how do you make fun of it, you know? And and my thing is, I genuinely do feel like a comedy has kind of spilled into the real world like like toxic sludge, and is is kind of, you know, I, it makes it makes everything impossible. Uh, uh, no one can do their jobs. Journalists 
can't uh, write accurately about sex offenders because they have to call them female pronouns, you know? So they're calling rapists she, you know? Um, uh, 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 policemen are 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 knocking on the doors of women who are who are have posters like adult human female. It's the the irreverence is out there. It's kind of the silliness of a of a, a policeman dressed as a giant um, LGBT bumblebee. How can you beat all that? It's all it's all there. I I I I am hoping to do a documentary on it all sometime, and I'm going to be just. All I have to do is line up all these all these true stories, you know. I mean, that's when they that's when they're funny. Sometimes they dip into stuff that, like, there's enough here for a series of paranoid thrillers as well. My friend Genevieve Gluck, uh, who writes Redux magazine, who many of you will know, she she's been she's been uh, uncovering the story, the Eunuch archives, um, and again. It's one of these things that I just, I just don't understand why, why everyone isn't talking about it. In fact, I did give it to a journalist and said, you know, is there anything you could do with this? And, and he said, I'm not touching that. He just said, I'm not touching that. And what it is, for those who don't know, is that the, um, the, the, the organization WPATH, which is uh, seen as the world leader for trans healthcare, uh, li links to a website called the Eunuch Archives. And they've also been trying to um, make Eunuch a gender identity. And uh, the reason they're doing this is because the Eunuch Archives is actually just a huge collection of erotic short stories about cutting your dick off, about persuading other people to cut their penis off, you know? There's something like 5,000 stories in this collection. 40% of them are tagged minor. That's 40% are pedophilic stories about persuading children to cut their penises off. This is linked to by WPATH. And I don't know if you remember, but, but WPATH is, is most famous because of Marcy Bowers, who is the chief surgeon at some hospital or other. Marcy Bowers is the person who operated on Jazz Jennings when Jazz Jennings was, I think, 17 years old, 16 years old. And uh, uh, Genevieve found two messages between members of this forum, the eunuch archives, and they said, thank you for the footage of the operation. I found it interesting, brackets, and a little arousing. You know? Now these people are are having influence on trans healthcare, which is about persuading young men to cut their penises off. So a story like that is so like something out of the film Seven, or you know the I mean that guy who said I'm not touching that story. I think you know Genevieve is genuinely frightened sometimes the stuff she's uncovering. You know, she just seems she she finds it. She's very interested in like one thing that's taken her attention recently is the fact that Lupron, which is what they're giving to these kids. Uh, it's not exactly Lupron. It's the same family. Be, they changed it because Lupron is the drug they gave to chemically castrate Alan Turing, you know. So they, so they, you know, a few years after everyone's like, oh, we need to put Alan Turing on banknotes because we treated him so terribly. And now they're castrate, chemically castrating gay kids with the same drug, which only changed its name because of the bad press it got off because of Turing, you know? Now I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that very last point. I, I just believe that's true. I haven't actually double checked that. So I better, better be cautious there. But um, but this is a this is what they're giving to young gay kids after their bleeding heart about oh we we really we should apologize when will the government apologize to Alan Turing and you know blah 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 and it's like you're doing it to kids right now you know so it's like too big for me I can't think of hmm now let's try and get some funny characters in a room and get them chortling to each other about about something or other i can't do it i feel like the i feel like the room is on fire 
and everyone's just sitting around talking. Every, you know, I, I, I have a feeling it's the same kind of uh, urgency that a lot of people feel about climate change. And I used to feel, but I don't really now because my faith in uh, the media and in institutions is so shaken that I, I, I genuinely just need to know, I just need to know what's true and what's not true. You know, you're calling JK Rowling a Nazi and you're also saying that 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 you know you're also giving other news stories. How can I believe you on one if you if you're if you're so utterly demented on another? You know, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you because we've got others to come in. I okay. mean, just just on the kids, it's interesting because I was reading that stuff about W Path and the guy who invented the trans flag and the kind of paedophilic influences. Now, I always try and avoid the paedophile question in this conversation, not because I don't think there's a reality to certain individuals, but I think what's much more important is actually trying to work out why the establishment have adopted the transgender issue, because it's not as if all head teachers, all heads of education, the EIS, which is the um, the teachers union in Scotland, has now just brought out a little book, I've printed it off, but they are completely behind the whole transgender thing. You've got companies, stage coaches, transgender, you know, all the universities fly the flags, banks fly the flags, institutions fly the flags, and so on. So it's a it's it's kind of there's there's definitely that element which is horrible and hugely problematic, but there's also this bigger question of what is going on in society, which I'm I'm not saying we we're gonna be able to answer that here now, and there's other people who want to answer ask questions as well. But I just wanted to throw in a, a in terms of uh, schools, when I mentioned nurseries, that this is in nurseries earlier, it's because I had a, a a nursery teacher mentioned to me about a month ago, not far from where I live uh, in Dundee, where their nursery school had a cull of their books. And one of the books they brought in as a replacement book was uh, Julian is a Mermaid. And Julian is a Mermaid is basically a book that promotes transgenderism so this is a book promoting transgenderism to four-year-old children which yeah. is which is absolutely astonishing and uh when people say this stuff's not really being promoted uh, i think they need to check themselves right i'm going to bring in three more uh, which is 07969 but i think better known as uh, i think this is rona if i am correct uh so if you unmute yourself hi rona Hello, good evening. Um, it's actually following on from what Stuart has just said there. What do you believe? I mean, you just said this is so huge. It is so huge. And the power behind the mermaids and Stonewall and the push for going into the schools, what is behind, well, well what is preventing the governments and councils taking a look at it being up for debate why is the debate being cancelled because all of us here i don't know anybody that is not concerned about all of this so why do you think the debate is being cancelled within councils and within governments great okay jules oh jules well after you have to unmute yourself hello good evening um, just a question about going forward, Graham. Um, what what do you think the the chances are, the realistic prospects of, of your musical coming um to be actually staged? Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, Joe. Musical being staged. Yeah. <laughs> Joe. I do have a, a sort of question to ask or a, a point to make, but really I only just raised my hand to say, hi, Graham. Do you remember oh, Do you remember meeting me and Rudy in, uh, at... Uh, oh, the, yeah, the, hello there. February, that was that was yeah. smashing. The photograph that I, I took of you and Rudy got more engagement on uh, social media than all my other contributions to social media put together either before or since. Well, that 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 was I'm sure down to Rudy's famous perm. I I, I uh, don't don't doubt that it had a lot to do with it. Uh, I I just agreed. I mean, as you know, Rudy and I were there um, representing the the Game Ends Network, and uh, I know you know Dennis. Uh, and um, uh, I just wanted to pick up a point that you made about how um, 
puberty is a, a human right. And um, Dennis has the slogan that puberty is a gay right because mm. it is predominantly um, same-sex attracted adolescents that are being sterilized. Mm. And um, it, it <laughs> it tears my knitting, I think they say, to, to hear that, that um, uh, the gender critical movement is attacking LGBTQ. Uh, I've got nothing to do with TQ. Um, TQ seem to hate me. And yeah. I suppose if, if the, uh, and they call me a queer. The last time I was called a queer was by uh, the DUP in the 1970s in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I resent it deeply and bitterly and it makes me angry and but apparently my feelings don't count apparently you can say whatever you want to me you can yeah. you can you can insult me as much as you like um yeah. you're, not, you're, you're not a real gay person according to these guys you know it's it's uh it's outrageous it's outrageous too yeah I, I i know you know uh joe that like Fred Sargent, who is an elderly, you know, pensioner who should be enjoying his retirement mm. and is most famous for basically he was there on all four nights of the original Stonewall riots, like his treatment on Twitter by these bastards is the most disgusting thing you've ever seen. And and while I mean, if you imagine this, you know, like like you're you're one of the people who was absolutely key uh in in earning uh civil rights for gay men and women in america and you're being erased from your own history and different people who didn't have much to do with it are being placed uh in the in the spot that 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 they took you out of it's absolutely disgraceful and uh, you know again I, i'm hoping with the book that i draw bring more attention to to these kinds of things, you know, because as Magdalene Byrne said, these people are homophobic. Mm -hmm. They're homophobic. It's that Susie Green and her husband are two homophobes who didn't like their, their son being gay. It's that simple. And if we know? can add to that, and I'm um, grateful to you for saying that, uh, Susie Green, straight woman uh, yeah. and a homophobe, um, joined forces with Julian Mom a straight yeah. man, to try and close down the only surviving charity that represents homosexuals. I mean, mm. just, just yeah. write that down. I yeah, mean, what I know. the hell is that? But like, you know, again, we all wondered here, there were other things that happened. Like I, I was told, you know, three years ago that there's no lesbian bars left in California. In California, you know, <laughs> so it's it's like you know, we 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 somehow. I think what it is is that I think there's a couple of things going on. Joe, is this okay for me to to? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's a few things going on. I think the th my big thing is that we never had a discussion about the internet. We never said, look, there were there was the human species before the internet, and now there's where we are now. We never had a discussion about what it would do to us, what changes it would bring about. It seems to me that all this is, the trans issue, is a uh, mass delusion uh, along the same lines as mass delusions in the past. But uh, And also it's, it's combined with, uh, I, I do think that in many cases, uh, the trans, uh, the, tr the distress that trans teenagers are feeling, or teenagers who call themselves trans, is because is basically a, an offshoot or a relation of anorexia, you know? Mm -hmm. And anorexia was similar. Anorexia was unknown until I think the 60s. Someone else might will know better than me. Uh, but And then it was like talked about in a newspaper or some study was released and boom, 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 suddenly there's cases everywhere. Because human beings... Uh, for evolutionary re reasons, are hardwired to copy each other. You know, it's what we it's it's what actually kept us alive and kept us able to move into different climates. You know, because you know suddenly it becomes important to know how to build a canoe when you're moving down into the Ecuadorian forest, 
and suddenly everyone's just just doing it because they 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 have to to survive and they copy each other now you take this thing which is an important part of human development and you and you and you and you just combine it with the internet which means that one two three four six however many people are here can suddenly talk to each other and exchange ideas you know it's great don't get me wrong it's a wonderful thing but we it's it's yin and yang there's like a a a half of this picture is is really bad the effect of pornography the effect of social contagion um the the effect of um Here's no, this, this actually goes back to the question of why is the debate cancelled uh, that, that was asked. The, you know, another thing that's happening, I mean, I, one of the reasons I got into trouble, I get into trouble is because I kind of pop, pop, popularized uh, the word grooming. You know, there was a woman on uh, who used to do YouTube videos. Her name was um, Lisa Muggeridge, and she was a social worker. And she did a number of videos. And the one that really hit me was one, she, one where she said, it takes just one person to groom an organization, you know? Uh, now by that, she meant the cl- grooming in the classic sense, a pedophile who uh, works in an or- a place like a hospital or, or a school and is not found out. Uh, and even when they're found out, her, their um, colleagues will swear blind that it must be a miscarriage of justice because groomers, they don't just groom children. They groom, you know, whole groups of people, organizations, schools, whatever it happens to be. Jimmy Savile through the television lens groomed the whole country, you know, now what we have is these people who are grooming institutions across the UK. Now, they're not all, I'm not saying that all these people are pedophiles. I do genuinely think there's some very, very good people who are spreading this stuff, but they're kind of victims of it too. They're groomed. You know, they've been groomed into thinking, for instance, that there's such a thing as a trans child. You know, that's grooming. That What happened to them is grooming. And so when you think of it in this lens, you begin to see why the debate has been cancelled. Because you have a whole organizations that have been told that it's actually, you know, things like, you know what, we should take the word woman out of advice for uh, uh, mums, because it might exclude <laughs> people who aren't, who aren't women or whatever the fuck it is, or mother. The Scottish SNP were given points by Stonewall, weren't they, for 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 removing the word mother from from maternal guidance? How they did that is kind of impressive. I mean, I'd like to have seen that document, but like, you know, this is grooming. This is you know, these are individuals uh, and their friends, and they're in WhatsApp groups and they're and they're giving each other advice on how to press this stuff through. And they're just carrying it all out. And not only that, like what's most frightening about this is, again, Jimmy Savile came in a world where there was very few platforms, you know. And now what we have is a a kind of uh, interconnected group of Jimmy Savile's who were able to coordinate and able to, to find enemies in the city. Like if you imagine, right, that Jimmy Savile had a bunch of friends who were like him. And, you know, as if, you know, there's no way Jimmy Savile was the only man like him Him at the time. He was just the one lucky enough to have become famous. Lots of Jimmy Savile's out there. And now suddenly they have access to tools that help them coordinate, help them uh, plan, uh, you know, like Jimmy, they used to say that the person Jimmy Savile hated the most were the older nurses because they knew what he was, you know, and he hated them. Well, now what they can do is they can destroy the older nurse's career, you know? So I do I'll think... Just, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just stop you there because I want to bring the three, three other people in. I mean, it's worth sure. worth pursuing this um, Joe's point because I think one of the things that is quite important over the next few years is to try and separate the LGB from the T. And I see one of the things, again, I think is interesting is that I think most people that promote this, most teachers who are carrying it out, who adopt it, who talk about uh, inclusion and so on, they genuinely are not anti-gay. They are into gay rights. They yeah. 
that um that, you know setting up lgbt clubs is kind of it's inclusive it's positive it's opening and so on and so that's so that's interesting but and see because what, what one of the things i think and you'll know better than me in terms of the sort of a shift in society it's almost to me as if there's a kind of moral vacuity in society so ireland in particular you can see a shift from when you had a very strong moral sense through the catholic church that then collapses in Britain, it's more political, I think, but you've got these a collapse of a kind of framework of morals, and yes. this stuff, this stuff, genuinely seems to give people a sense of moral worth. They genuinely feel that they are doing something really worthwhile and good. Yeah. It's got that really curious and dangerous moral quality. Anyway, I'll bring these three. I'll bring Link, Linda Devlin. Uh, I didn't answer Jules's question. Uh, yeah, ha hang on to it, because I'll bring these in. Okay. We'll, I, we'll run out of time. So I'll bring in uh, Linda Devlin, I think, if you want to yeah. unmute yourself, which you can do now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. hello. Go for it. Hi. I just want to say that I've spent my career in children's services and the last 20 years I ran a CAM service in London. So I worked quite closely with the Tavistock through periods of my career. And oh, yeah. most people that are actually working, and I've followed the, the Tavistock stuff, um, and most people that work for the Tavistock are absolutely bereaved. It's what happened to the to the Tavistock. Mm. Um, but, you know, that that this wasn't typical CAMs. Um, that the Tavistock was losing money um, and Gids was bringing in the money. Right. So so there's a whole big debate in that. Now, as a, a, a local CAMS manager, I had to report all sorts of things to our commissioners, you know, things like who we were seeing, what we were seeing them for, did it have a good outcome, that sort of basic stuff. Mm. Gids, NHS England were commissioning that specialist service yeah, they were never asking, who is it you're seeing? Mm. <laughs> you know, they, they certainly weren't asked, did it work? What outcomes were they getting? Kids were being given things like puberty blockers. These puberty blockers were for kids that, as you said earlier, that had precocious pu puberty, and they come off them once they reach the age for puberty. There's been no research whatsoever into what that would do if you were taking those on a long-term basis. So they weren't reporting back in outcomes. Um, there were, yeah. you know, so I had to ask, you know, what is the role of NHS England in all of this? How come they're they're allowing it to happen? You know that, and my experience of like when something is this systemic, and it is systemic, it's it's everywhere you look now, and it's a spectrum, obviously, because as I said earlier on, there are these kids that have genuine gender dysphoria, and they were very small, very rare. That's why the Tavistock was set up in the first place. Because, you know, no CAMs anywhere had enough to, to deal with that specialism on their own. Now it's a third of the referrals. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a third yeah. of the referrals are into, into CAMs for this. And nobody's asking why. Nobody's asking why young girls don't want to be girls anymore. Um, that, that whole debate has been shut down. And this has to be led somewhere along the line at the other end of the spectrum, which is that... You know, this is a male fetish movement, you know, yeah. that it's and I'm sure that there's parts of the government that are unwittingly being opportunistic about this, saying there's something in this for us. We can create um, you know, woke wars, we can, you know, we can take the, the public's focus away from the cost of living crisis, the things that they should be, you know, and and focus on this. So it, it is a spectrum. Um yeah. but there, there, there must be people with power and there must be people with money behind this somewhere and we're just not getting to the bottom of that where that's coming from. Right, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, Linda. Uh, Sally? Um, hello, can you all hear me? I hope yes. you can. Hello, Sally. Um, hi. Uh, what concerns me about all this, right, is how the most effective means of pushing back against it, to use an American term, and you, Graham, were talking about this business of it only taking one person to groom an institution. And 
I think that one of the best things that we all of us can do is to actually go into schools as governors, to become school governors, all this kind of thing. And I think this would be something which is very effective. And I was talking, I mean, I actually used to be a lecturer for a long, long time. And I was talking to my sister-in-law, who's working now as a teacher. I'm in, a, in London. She's in a London school. Mm. And she's in, a, she's not a teacher, actually. she's a classroom assistant. And I said, I said what my plans were. And she said, oh, they're going to hate you. And I said, well, you know. I mean, and, and frankly, yeah, fine, yeah. bring it on, you know. But I think that we really need to be thinking in this way, you know, right, how are we going to get these fuckers, you know? And, and and ultimately, that's what we need to do because you, Graham, are doing a great job. But the thing is that they got the march on us because they got into those institutions very quickly. And mm. in a way, and I just want to say one other thing, and I was talking about this to a friend and she said, in a way, they kind of, um, they showed their hand a little bit too soon because now we're aware. And now lots of people, and I think that the thing that is really pissing people off is about the kids, mm. really pissing people off. Anyway, yeah. so I'll shut up now. That's what oh, I want no, to say. That's great. Thanks, thanks, Ali. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, like someone once said, someone said recently, the, the big mistake they made was coming for the, ki for the kids. That's when everybody sat up straighter, you know. Sorry. Anyway, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Linda Murdoch. Yeah, I uh, I just wanted to just like everybody else, I suppose I'm trying to grapple with where who's driving all this and where it's all coming from, uh, because it seems really quite. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of stuff seems really out, out of this world. Why would anybody do any of this stuff? There are other subjects in society that are also cancelled. So it's mm. not, you know, it's not just you can't talk about trans. You know, you, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to criticize the trans. There, there are other issues where you also get cancelled. Yes. Um, yeah. Like the like the critical race stuff. Whenever you raise a hand about that, you're cancelled. Climate catastrophe. Whenever anybody says, well, wait a minute, there's climate change, but is it a catastrophe? Um, and are we to blame? you're immediately cancelled about that. So that makes me think that there's something far more profound going on here than just, I mean, even though it's absolutely despicable and tragic that our children are being um, experimented on and what's happened to women's rights. Um, and, you know, Graeme, you, you pointed out that, that women's, it, it, you really understand how fragile women's rights actually are, the way that they're, they're, they're now being completely and utterly undermined. But to me, this is indicative of a much more profound problem in our society. And it means that we're going to have to mount quite a concerted attack here. You know, all our major institutions have been can have been captured by this trans stuff and with uh, race ideology and with climate catastrophe. Um, the civil service, the civil servants can't speak up about this because they're too scared. Mm. Teachers can't speak up about it. University lecturers can't speak up about any of these three issues. Mm. So it seems to me this is an elite project that's been driven from the very top, which is a way for our elites to try and solve their problems because they're in a complete state and a complete mess. Yeah. And I think I think we have to there there are some like, like the, you know, like Sue has written a bit about this and Spike writes about it. Yeah. And the Battle of Ideas writes about it. But and I, th and I think that the only way we're really going to be able to challenge the trans issue, and it needs to be challenged, is actually to realise that this is a, that this is a systemic um, problem. Yeah. It's not just one thing. There are a whole number of things in there that we have to take up. Yes, it, it's, a di it's a difficult one, isn't it? And it, it's like there's so many different things going on. But I, I, agree, with, uh, I agree with Sally that a good way to um to to get uh address it or or um fight it is by developing the courage to be disliked you know you do have to be the person in the room who everyone hates and uh who uh wants nothing to do with you but like you know i look at someone like zoe uh i think her name is holloway she's in the lib dems and you may people may have seen her being booed at uh, some uh, Lib Dem event, and I met her, and and 
she has a quality that I see in a lot of people who are in this fight. They just skip along. They skip along. Because because they're happy that they they they're doing it. They're standing up, you know. All of us. I mean, I have different reasons for not being able to sleep, but but when I do sleep, I sleep like a baby, because like you know, I I have not a a, a moment of doubt about this, you know. So when you're armed with something like that, a certainty that you've tested, you because you're all smart people. You've looked into it. You've read about it. You've thought about it. You know, you've also been told that that these thoughts are evil and wrong and you're a bad person. So you've put the hours in already, you know, you've put the hours in. So you don't have you can go to you can be a governor and have people spit, you know, invective at you and just sit there thinking, well, whatever, you know, I'm still right, you know. And, 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 you know, you, you just like, let me try and <laughs> try and crowbar in an answer to the question about the musical being staged. You know, my, my thing on the musical is, is, is just that, you know, they all owe me, they do, my colleagues owe me an apology. Um, but I think it will come because I think that like, eventually they'll realize that there's just a big pile of money lying there that they can't have access to because they've supported one of the most horrific medical uh, scandals of all time. <laughs> you know, I that's why I'm slightly optimistic. I just don't think that position is is tenable, you know? So, um, you know, I mean, I I want to, I, I, I don't want to bore people. It's a terrible thing to suddenly uh, 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 bring up board games or the rules of games. There's nothing that makes people's eyes glaze over more than explaining the rules of a board game. But there's a game, there's a party game my wife and I used to play called um, Werewolf. And uh, it's a hidden roles game. You sit around 13 people around a table uh, they all get little pieces of paper with their role on them. Two of them are given a piece of paper that says werewolf. Everyone else is given a piece of paper that says villager. And the aim of the game, oh yeah, sorry, it's divided into a night and day phase. Uh, there's one person running the game who gets to see what's going on. And, and that person says, it's nighttime, everyone go to sleep. Everyone closes their eyes. Then the uh, person running the game says, werewolves, open your eyes. The two werewolves, wherever they are around the table, they open their eyes and they see the other one and they give a little thumbs up to show that they've uh, taken them in. And then the, the person running the game says, werewolves, choose someone to kill this night. So the werewolves go, this guy, Frank, we kill Frank. Okay, like that. And they close their eyes again. So, okay, it's the morning. And the adjudicator says, in the morning, I'm afraid you woke up and Frank was killed. And everyone around the table, including the two werewolves, go, oh, Frank was killed. Oh, my goodness. Who, you know, who could have done that? Um, and then they are they have to have a discussion, right? And at the end of the day, all the villagers have to vote on who they're going to kill, who they believe to be a werewolf and who they're going to kill. Now, the game continues like that, like the person is taken away who they decide on. And, oh, no, it wasn't a werewolf. And everyone goes, oh, no, including the two werewolves. And the next thing, it's the night time again. Two werewolves are looking at each other. We're going to kill her next. Okay, close their eyes. And then the daytime uh, bit happens again, and they start lying again. Now, the game continues until all the villagers are killed. Or, no, it's all but two. All but two villagers are killed. The werewolves, the, the villagers win if they kill both werewolves. Okay? Werewolves win if they kill all but two villagers. And here's the interesting thing. This is why I bring it up and why I think it's so fascinating. The game was originally called uh, uh, Mafia, and it was invented in a Russian university by a, soci a sociology uh, student who wanted to prove his thesis. And this is the thesis. An informed minority will always win a communications battle with an uninformed majority. And that's what's happening at the moment. You might think of all these kind of captured institutions as being influenced by this informed minority. And by working together, by following certain things they've, they've been doing very successfully up until this point, to silence debate, to shut people down, to, 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 to put some certain things outside of um, polite discussion, They've managed to finesse this whole conversation, you know, certain things are unsayable because of this small minority 
uh, but informed minority who are affecting the wider debate. So the thing is, I don't know, I just, I, I bring that up simply because, oh yeah, and, and here's the interesting thing. The thesis was proved because the werewolves, even though there's only two of them, the werewolves usually win, you know? They did, did a bunch of games and the werewolves win again and again and again. Like two people in a, in a table full of 11, 13 people and the werewolves usually win. I used to play, I used to be very good at it, but I was a master. Like I would, I would uh, actually turn in the other werewolf to distract attention away from me, <laughs> and uh, and I won that one, you know. So so basically, when you're in on something like these connected Jimmy Savile uh, 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 thing, I'm I'm telling you about when you're all in on something, you know, like basically, like you have two. Let's take two people. You have the paedophile who wants to use this to gain access to trans children who are placed outside nor normal safeguarding procedures. For instance, they're told not to speak to their parents. They're told to keep secrets from their parents, okay? You've the Jimmy Savile type who likes that for obvious reasons, but you also have on the other end of the spectrum, a very loving, concerned teacher who thinks they're doing the best thing for the, for the child by removing them from their parents, by breaking normal safeguarding procedures. Those two people are in a conspiracy together and one doesn't even know it. You know, the pedophile knows it, but the, the kind, gentle person who wants to help, you know, who thinks they're doing the right thing, they don't know it. Right. And so it's a kind of a confluence of a, of a number of different people between the pedophile on one end and the kindly teacher on the other, there's a, a a spectrum, if you will, of um, of motivations, uh, and uh, and they all find common cause in in this issue, and they all uh, they all move forward. Like you know, I would say that it's not exactly a bad political move at the moment to say trans rights. I'd say that's how you get ahead. Certainly, certainly true. Your career is over if you if you if you don't say it. You know, so so there's a there, there's a kind of a mass movement. Of can, can, can I just throw in then, and, and, and we've we've got to finish in a minute, so I'll not drag this out too much. But and can I, can I just say thanks to everyone for their questions and uh, for, it, it was really enjoyable. Thank you. Yeah. Um. You see, because I think there's a there's a kind of certain logic to what you say, but I think, see, I'm thinking about writing a book on what trying to explain why the elites promote transgender ideology because it is the elites that have adopted this and it's not that the elites are pedos and it's not that the elites are idiots but there must be something about the culture in general so the thing i'm interested in for for example is the idea of a culture of narcissism a kind of form, form of uh, a kind of self preoccupation, and especially a world where we're incredibly increasingly encouraged to think that we're the center of the universe. You know, be the real you, be the authentic you, and so on. And how that then develops into a preoccupation with the body. So, I, I mean, I personally think the fact that everyone has a tattoo is connected to the trans issue. Right? Mm -hmm. Because the body, the body, how you find a sense of identity, we no longer have a sense of identity with the world outside ourselves, with morals or with politics or something big. Mm. Increasingly, we're told it's the, you know with the rise of identity politics, find your own identity, and part of that becomes we have a sense of our identity through ourselves. So I think there's a lot of big, big cultural issues that are bound up in this that go well beyond activism i think then activism then it's almost like they're parasitic on a wider culture i mean i'll i'll throw that to you and then i'll, I'll bring it to an end well one thing I, I suggest everybody does uh if they want to uh dig into i know someone was bringing up the other subjects that you get cancelled for um, and uh, one thing that I really suggest everyone look into, there's a few very good documentaries about it online, is the Grievance Studies hoax. Um, that was Peter Bogosian, James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose, three academics, and they submitted fake papers to peer-reviewed journals to see if they would get in. 
and I think four or five were published before they were caught. One of them was sent into a feminist magazine. Uh, and when I say feminist, I mean this new style of feminism that seems to place men at the center of uh, feminism. And um, it was actually just a translated section of Mein Kampf by Hitler, by good old Adolf. And he and it was really it, it was it was just text from Mein Kampf with a few um, scattered uh, uh, feminist uh, buzzwords, you know. So that got published in a in a peer reviewed journal, you know. So so I think what's important to understand is these are ideas have all trickled down from American academia, you know. You 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 see it in things like the the use of the word folk. Trans folk, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with hearing that a lot. You hear people in Derbyshire saying it. Why are you saying folk? You know, you're not Obama. You're, 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 you know, this was like when Obama used folk, it was a very, very clever uh, bit of rhetoric. It, it drew people together. It, 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 it was a very unifying word for Americans. Very, very clever bit of uh, uh, um, uh, political speech by Obama. But when you say trans folk, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Again, it collects a group of people who have nothing in common with, with each other under the same thing. So, so I'm constantly seeing American Americanisms uh, 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 used by the other side of this debate. And, you know, you can tell that it's just because they are picking up everything from, 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 from Silicon Valley, from Hollywood, you know, from what they think it sounds like a cool way of talking, you know. So you see again English and Scottish and Irish people going, Y'all, y'all need to. It's like, what the fuck are you why are you talking like that? You know? So, so uh, you know, again, I think that kind of it goes back to the fact that we 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 have to um we have to have a conversation about the internet, about what the internet has done to us, you know. This this fire that's currently breaking out, it was it was it was set by the internet. And 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 we can't be talking about the fire and how to stop other fires from breaking out without without looking into how it came about. And and I think that's the way. You right. know, we have Correct. to have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I'll just uh I know people can't really applaud. You can do the little little funny little yellow hand claps if you want. Take it in red. I'll take I was, it in red. You don't I, need to do that. I, I was saying this to Graham earlier, and I think it's genuinely true that people like him in the future, people in the public eye who are doing what he is doing, few and far between though they are, will be remembered like the people who stood up against the McCarthy witch trials uh, in the in the nineteen fifties. Uh, and there will be films made about people and people like Graham will be seen uh, in a heroic light, hopefully in the future. But to do that, I think one of the main things that we have to do is to create organisations that can get parents and teachers together to actually start to take this on, which is why we have set up the Scottish Union for Education. So... Um, yeah, and anything you anything I could do to help uh, amplify and and share stuff, let yeah, me know. Yeah, I will. I'll send you stuff. And we are uh, launching a campaign soon to raise a hundred thousand pounds. So if any of our audience have a thousand pounds in your back pocket, you can go to our Substack, uh, and which is Scottish Union for Education Substack. And in the join section, you can join, get the Substack. Uh, it's £25 for a year, become a member. Uh, and if you wanted to give us a big fat donation, do feel free because um, we've just set up the parents and supporters group, which is going to be an online national organisation, hopefully to bring parents uh, and teachers and grandparents together to try and do something about this. So... All I can do now is just say I'm absolutely delighted that you came, Graham. It went over time. I thought it might. Uh, thank you for everyone who asked questions. And thank you, Graham.